Good morning, everyone. I see most of DEF CON is not here today because it is Saturday morning. I kind of expected that. So welcome to I Fight for the Users, episode one, Attacks Against Top Consumer Products. I'm Zach. Th this Hi, is Erin. She's Sec Barbie. And we always like to start with a slide of what our credentials are. We like to always say, don't trust the speaker just because they're up here. Trust them because you validate what they're saying. So instead of having a long list of certifications, things we do, we like to say, judge us for everything else. They're pretty smart, though. So before we get started, uh, it's Aaron's first time speaking at DEF CON. <laughs> and we've been informed that goons are no longer allowed to do shots with first time speakers. Boo! So this is Aaron's way of celebrating. Congratulations, Aaron. I brought All right, so before we get started, and in all seriousness, this is our, our con speaker rule 101. So both Zach and myself have been ar around this game a few, few years. And what we see persistently is companies go out and they, they love to use these conferences as great PR hooks. So I want to start off by apologizing to every single news media outlet that reached out to us. But we learned really quickly years ago that as soon as you start dropping information, especially when you have things like consumer product, IOT, your talk will get pulled right away. So you've heard probably very little about what we're going to talk about, but we hope to excite you with a few, uh, I don't know, names. We're not being very vague today. So welcome to DEF CON. Okay. So we're, we're kind of covering three different topics here today. First is we're going to talk about, or I'll talk about Bluetooth, uh, some fun things with that for Bluetooth low energy. Uh, Aaron's going to be talking about some wireless security products, uh, especially on the camera side. And then I'll also talk about, uh, on Windows security side, some fun things we found on there. So you might be like, this is a little ADD. This seems a little oddball to be jumping all over the place. Uh, yeah, it, it is. Uh, but <laughs> having one talk that goes on for 45 minutes, it kind of gets a lot of setup, a lot of like, okay, well, let's talk about ourselves. We spent five minutes now. Um, let's talk about the background of this. So we just want to get through it, and we're kind of ADD by nature about the stuff we want to look at. So we figured what better format than to just kind of jump through a bunch of fun topics and do it that way. So first thing, Bluetooth. Um, yes, we have another Bluetooth talk. We, we've had a few Bluetooth talks over the last four days, including Black Hat. Um, Blue Hydro was released this week by uh, Zero Chaos and Granolox over at uh, DEF CON 101 earlier. Um, we've got a talk coming up about pick actually it's today, isn't it? The mm -hmm. Bluetooth lock picking uh, from a mile away. That's really cool. I do want to go see it actually. Nice um, and then over at Black Hat side, there is a gap proxy tool and a replay um, tool and a kind of fun Bluetooth suite. So why do we have another talk about Bluetooth low energy? Um, so a little backstory. Um, I like magic. Uh, <laughs> I've always been kind of fascinated with it. And I always had this dream as a kid to start a magic bar, like a theme kind of magic bar. And yes, they exist, but I, it was kind of my little thing of like being able to have fun with that. And there's always the basic rules of magic. One, never reveal, reveal a secret. Two, never repeat the same trick twice. Three, practice over and over and over, right? And so one and three we can get covered, but how do you in a restaurant or some other establishment track if you've shown the same trick to someone over and over and over? So it kind of got my mind going as to how can you track who someone is in any kind of environment. So I kind of came up with this long list of ideas as to how you could <laughs> track someone. You know, can you get them on the car on the way in through a license plate reader, through their electronic toll collection RFID, through Bluetooth on their car? Uh, and there was a great talk two or three years ago about how the toll systems are using Bluetooth to track cars. Um, if they come in by foot, though, or you're in a major metropolitan area where people aren't ca coming by car, um, could you do it by facial recognition, voice recognition, different ways of their cell phone, what do they have on them, um, credit card, all these different fun things. And then always the not so fancy ways of just asking what is your name. Um, and so I kind of was thinking about like, well, how do you, tr outside of like this from that kind of application, how do you track someone, right? And so it kind of came down to these three areas of, or four areas of like, well, these are the key ways that if you could get positive data that isn't all garbage. Um, but Wi-Fi is a little bit of a problem. Uh, so. We've gone through the Wi-Fi tracking thing for years. We've talked about it, about how the phones are probing for Wi-Fi. I'm not going to dive too much into it, but uh, I hate to pick on Nordstrom's because I love them, but they were the ones who got called out hard. Home Depot was doing it too. All of them kind of stopped this practice, but it was 
a way that we were tracking user behavior is by looking for the Bluetooth or the Wi-Fi probes from your phone. Uh, but the mobile device manufacturers caught on to this. They started doing randomized MAC addresses. And they decided that, okay, only if you connect to a genuine SSID will I take and actually display my real Mac. So we kind of take it as a data point, but we don't trust it now for Wi-Fi as not all devices randomized, but most kind of do on a mobile device right now. So that leaves us with Bluetooth, car keys, RFID loyalty card. That's kind of the key ideas I was like messing with in my head. And well, yeah, we could do car keys. I, I'm not great on my SDR skills. I'm getting better. But, uh, and the RFID loyalty card is kind of lame. So let's talk about Bluetooth. I'm not going to spend too much time on Bluetooth 101. If you want to learn more about Bluetooth and its stacks, there's plenty of talks about it. But for those of you who are catching up with us today, uh, Bluetooth Classic uses one, meg one megahertz channels, has 79 of them for data, one for broadcast, hops at 1,600 times a second. The MAC address, effective MAC address, the address it uses, uses a uh, upper address part and a lower address part to make up the address. You only get the lower address part in the packets. Um, and we all know about this. And the only thing that's really using Bluetooth now is obviously audio devices, um, he headphones, Bluetooth earpieces, that kind of stuff. But we've kind of moved a lot more to this Bluetooth low energy, or as Bluetooth likes to call it, Bluetooth smart. Smart. Um, and we talked about a lot about the insecurity in the past at other talks. It's 37 channels, they're 2 megahertz wide for data, 3 announcement channels, and then the increment of rotation of those channels and the interval and all that is dictated when it does the join to the master. And what you get basically is you have a 6 byte address, effectively a Mac we'll call it for the sake of everyone, um, that's used to do it in the advertisement. And then when it actually connects, a 4 byte access address that is actually used to communicate for that session. Everyone with me so far? I know it's early, but I don't want to waste too much time on Bluetooth. So <laughs> Bluetooth does have security, though. When we talked about the Wi-Fi randomization, um, the Bluetooth group actually started a randomization also for its, its addresses in Bluetooth Smart. Uh, and actually, this is the, the funny thing. They actually have an ad on their site, or not an ad, a blog post on their site about protecting your privacy with Bluetooth. We've got good stuff. And they use this photo of this child walking alone. The biggest FUD I've seen in a long time of scaring you of like, my kid's being tracked. Oh my God. <sighs> so, like I said, there's the access address, right? That's what's actually used in those data packets. Um, but they change upon the disconnect and reconnect every time a device is connecting, except for in the advertisements in which it's static. Um, so long-term tracking of these access addresses isn't so reliable. Uh, obviously, if a device is connected for a long time, you can track some behavior moving throughout for an hour, two hours. But if there's any kind of disconnect activity, it'll regenerate. So it gives you a good short-term tracking. But from a long-term perspective, you can't really track someone with those access addresses. So it got me thinking. So we, we've got randomized addresses on that side. We've got randomized addresses on the access, or on the advertisements in the access. So what else is there? So when it comes to Bluetooth, there's two different kind of profiles. There's the generic access profile, GAP, and the generic attribute profile, GAT. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to dive too much into these because obviously this is not a one-on-one talk. Um, but basically, the GAP and GAT profile provide the communication standard for communicating to the device to basically set up the connection and actually communicate with the services that the, device, the slave has. So I started looking at these devices to see what could be tested. And obviously, you go around, and you play with the tools. You're like, OK, nothing, 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 nothing. I travel a lot, um, a lot. So <laughs> I've noticed when I was on planes that all of a sudden, a lot of devices started showing up. It's odd. Um, so normally, walking around, you saw a few devices. And we, we didn't really know what the behavior of all these devices were. We saw certain Fitbits and that kind of stuff. But what, What's the deal? So it turns out that certain devices, when they are disconnected from their phones or whatever they're paired to, uh, they jump back into advertisement mode. So uh, for your simple coding pleasure, if it's not paired, it goes into advertisement mode. Uh, and, and again, this is unique behaviors we started determining with some of these devices. So can we get devices to disconnect and actually take and start broadcasting again? Uh, the, the answer is, uh, yeah, we can. Uh, it's interesting that you can actually jam the 2.4 gigahertz range with uh, some success, right? Uh, basically, the, using the USRB, P, USRP B210, uh, you have about 56 megahertz of bandwidth. It's not reliable, uh, especially it takes a lot to drive it. But you can basically effectively create a 2.4 gigahertz jammer using a SDR 
uh, by generating some random data and all. And so we did this and we tested it and we noticed by jamming the t <laughs> those frequency bands of 200 2428 megahertz to 2478 megahertz, so basically that 50, 50 megahertz band, we can actually take and get the devices to fall off and jump back to their advertisement channels. Uh, but obviously this depends on the host. Uh, I have to give credit to iOS. They have great frequency hopping and detection. So basically the phone detects, okay, I see a lot of jamming. I'm going to move to this frequency band and repair. So it does have some reliability, but it's a little odd. The other way to get them to disconnect is by <laughs> blasting terminate connection packets. Uh, this is basically effectively the, the Bluetooth version of DAUTH. Is you look for the access address and then you just spoof a disconnect and it terminates. Now granted, again, limited window and it gets wonky with some devices. Uh, we know some devices don't like to rejoin after they've been told to disconnect. So it's one of those things that if you're trying to track someone, it kind of gives you some good opportunity to get an ID from them and get the connection to the advertisement side, but not so much that it's not going to be noticed. So we've all talked about tracking before, right? So why am I rambling about tracking, tracking, tracking? Well, a lot of the talk before has been about, well, it's possible. Okay, well, with who, with what? You know, this is really more of an implementation issue. Um, this is when it comes down to individual devices implementing it, especially on the consumer side, what does what? Amazon and Best Buy probably loves me by now because <laughs> I just bought a crap ton of Bluetooth low energy devices that people use every day. Um, and we're going to go through a few of them and said what we tested and basically we did a consumer report style kind of testing against them to see what privacy information are they actually leaking. And we'll start with the worst. Sorry, I need water. These guys were on Shark Tank a while back and you may have heard them because it's kind of a funny idea of shocking yourself every time you do something bad. Um, <laughs> It's also a fun thing to shock your friends when they do something bad and they're like, oh, I'm trying to learn good behavior. What, what, stop it. Um, but basically they use a static MAC address. The MAC address last four, sorry, eight bits, eight bits, 16 bits, 16 bits, sorry, math is hard. Last 16 bits of the MAC is actually in the SSI, or in the name of the device. Correct me on my math. Um, and if you don't happen to have the, the MAC address from the static MAC address or from it in its name, Send a GAT request to it and it gives it to you <laughs> in ASCII to hex. I don't, I just, somebody wrote a bad converter on that. So this is super easy to track because we have a static address, never rotates. But like I said, they've started implementing this rotation in Bluetooth Smart that devices are starting taking advantage of. But then we have these devices that are meant to track you. Um, tracker and Tile, we'll talk about Tile next. But uh, effectively, these addresses, they show up in the broadcast as being random, uh, and they do generate a random one because the uh, IDs rotate through it, but the ID actually never really <laughs> rotates on it. Uh, the MAC address we've noticed over a period of over four months, they never rotated. Said they did, but they never rotate. So it effectively seems that as the device powers on, it generates a new one, but it never powers off, it never rotates after that. As well as with these devices meant to track you, it's meant to, as a community can track you, so Hey, regardless of the MAC address, there's a static ID associated in the gap profile that will take and actually dis display, in the case of the tracker, the raw MAC address of the device. And it constantly broadcasts when it's disconnected. Tile is the same way. Um, the tile identifier in GAT is uh, one of the services in there. Uh, again, static MAC address effectively because it does randomize but never rotates. Uh, it randomizes on boot. And it stays connected to a device but only while the Tile app on a phone is open. Once you close the Tile app, it disconnects. Our friends over at Fitbit, the Fitbit One, also uses a random MAC address, but after about four months, we didn't really notice it rotate at all. Uh, it doesn't remain connected to a mobile device at all. So basically, to save energy, it only connects when you connect to it and say, "Hey, how many steps do I have? What's my my time? All that stuff." But it does remain connected, so it's constantly broadcasting as well. So things have started to get better after this, a little bit. Uh, with the Withings Active, another device we tested, the MAC address randomizes, but it still advertises the raw MAC address in the advertisement data which broadcasts out. So while the MAC address is changing, it's advertising its real MAC address inside the manufacturer data. Uh, okay, uh, that's a security choice. <laughs> then the Pebble Steel also uses, a, another way we could track the devices is in their name, and we've talked about this before too, but has in the name the last four digits, I'm done doing math, 
um, of the MAC address. And it's random, but still after days of rebooting the device and turning it on and off and losing power, it still kept the same static address. Uh, but advertising as random. Again, in the device info in the gap profile, it's got the serial number of the device, and it goes to sleep every once in a while, so it's not really reliable. But as a cool choice, it also uses classic, so we can track its lower address too. So interesting choices on how it connects. The Fitbit Alta, the MAC address randomizes, but again, like all the other ones, they stay static for four months even after battery loss. Um, getting a little bit better. This one doesn't turn Bluetooth on until you actually turn it on to sync mode. This one has the name of, or the Microsoft band has the name of the address uh, inside of the device name, and it does randomize the Mac. So we're halfway there. We got a name that's kind of static as to what you set it for, but the addresses are rotating. So, and then on the better side of things, the people who actually implemented security well, we got to give credit to Apple. They rotate their Macs pretty well. Android Wear, um, this was on sale. Thank you, Amazon Prime Day. Hey. <laughs> um, but also notice that this is really cool on the uh, Android Wear watch is once it's connected, it stops responding to broadcasts forever. Uh, basically, it'll still randomize, it'll connect to the device it knows, but unless you go into the watch and say, let me reconnect, it doesn't respond to broadcasts anymore. So I have to give kudos to them because that's actually the best we saw of all the things. iOS devices as well like to broadcast some Bluetooth low energy noise. Uh, they do randomize though and advertise that they're an iPhone, iPad, et cetera, but that MAC address randomizes constantly. So while it's being used in <laughs> fun apps, including Safari, we noticed, um, take that one on for size and think about that. It does randomize quickly and randomly, so there's not really any trackability on the actual iOS devices we noticed. So we have to give kudos to these three doing it right. The rest we kind of went through quick because it's kind of the consumer report style. Um, and what we were going to do is we were going to release a tool with this to kind of track all these things. Fuck you, Zero Chaos. He kind of beat us to the punch and got a better tool out. So I just said, nope, bravo, we'll, we'll, we'll do it on that side and point over there because they, they did a great job on that. So the Pony, uh, Pony Express crew released this, uh, was it Thursday at 101? Yeah, I think he posted it probably three days before there and four days before then. So um, this is definitely a great tool to look at for tracking those things. It doesn't, I don't think it supports GAT yet, but I'm sure it will soon if I have a few more minutes to tweak some code. So where do we go from here about all these devices? We complain about them all, um, and I spent 15 minutes rambling about this. Um, we really need to start testing more and more of these devices to determine what's the implementation issues with them instead of just like, well, it's a problem. With these new IoT things, it's obviously a problem across the space, and we've all can complain about IoT this, IoT that. Um, so we're throwing up on, oh, I forgot to actually commit this this morning. Uh, <laughs> throwing up on GitHub, uh, basically a repository that everyone can submit pull requests to that as you test the device and say, hey, I looked at this and it does this, 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 this behavior and we'll have a little checklist of things we're looking for that we can all kind of source together as to, hey, here's how this specific device behaves, here's the trackability of this device. Not that it's possible, not fill people with FUD, 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 uh, but that it's actually possible, or that it's possible for this device and this implementation. Long story short, uh, when MAC addresses are random, look for things that aren't involved in the MAC addresses, which include not actually randomizing them, the uh, gaps and gats leaking serials, and the device names. You can knock a device off Bluetooth uh, using either uh, the DAUTH packets or actually broadcasting on 2.4 gigahertz, a lot of noise, um, certain frequencies. And when the standard, while the standard of Bluetooth is great, supports a lot of cool stuff, uh, these devices aren't implementing it. All right, I'm gonna switch it over now to Aaron, who's gonna talk more about the home security side. All right, this is a squirrel part of our talk. Squirrel. Oh, he's not done. He has to get back up again. Don't you guys, don't do that to him. Just give him a minute. Right, yeah, right. You're gonna, yeah, don't, don't feed the ego. Not yet. Later, later. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about consumer wireless camera and office security. So before we get into this, we've had lots of talks about uh, wireless, CCTV, all this kind of stuff. So let's chat about what we're not going to talk about. We are not going to talk about weaker default passwords. You guys have Google. You can use it. Yes, everybody, with the exception of maybe 10% of people, still use all of these. Congratulations. We're also not going to talk about IP weaknesses. But if you want to make your uh, network even more insecure, this guy on YouTube can actually help you out and tell you exactly how to route it to the external internet if you really want to. Good times. I mean, it was helpful. It was his intent. We're also not going to talk about deauthing 101. Um, everybody has Google. Download Kali. 
use some Google Foo, and you can figure out yourself how to buy the cards that'll work and deauth it yourself. So, hint. Hint. Also, we're not going to talk about Shodan. It's awesome. Not this talk, though. Go have fun with it. And I wanted to put a slide up and say we're also not going to talk about Pokemon Go because it's almost as fun as Shodan. But so, uh, so who cares about these CCTV cameras and the security? Well, you know what? It grinds my gears. I care because these camera companies are selling it as security devices. Not all of them. Most of them are selling security. <clears throat> so that got me to thinking, you know, what if? What if these were used as security devices? Well, I want to be a bad guy, and for anybody that knows me knows that I have a little problem when it comes to automobiles. I like them a lot. <laughs> so, uh, so step one in my little mental process when I was thinking about these cameras was, was kind of getting into the mood. So I wanted to channel my inner sway and think about, hmm, if I had this, this absolutely amazing warehouse full of Ferraris that was protected by these security cameras, what would I do? This also plays into homes and stuff, but I find Ferraris to be a lot more fun than thinking about the homes right now. So the first thing I would do, get into the mood. Second thing I would do, I'd get some information. Information's are pretty easy to find. Especially, you know, we have this technology, or I'm going to use that really loosely. Everyone in this conference, we've been talking about war driving for freaking years, decades almost. Wow, decades. Wow, that's old. Anyway, that's old. it's old. So some people call it war driving. In this case, we're going to call it target identification. So with that, you can drive around because these devices are lovely and like to tell you who they are all the time. And in their MAC addresses, you can actually tell who they're from. So you can go onto the nice little Googles, help us out again and identify who exactly these cameras belong to. Or you can actually just look for the cute little stickers that come with the cameras that say, hey, you're on camera. And some of them even have the brand name on them. Even easier. So with that, I'm thinking about where the attack goes. So obviously, we've had many talks that have talked about um, wireless de-authing and whatnot. So let's take that a little bit of a step further. This talk was kind of composed with the idea that let's find out what these cameras actually do. Let's find out what happens when they get de -auth. Let's find out, do they notify, do they recover? So in the attack, we're going to be thinking about the fact of how long it would take an intruder to get into a facility, a building, a house, whatnot, what they would have to do ahead of it, how long they would have to de -auth the cameras, and could they make it away clean, so to speak? So that being said, you know, we're not going to talk about point of entry and whatnot. Like Zach said earlier, there's a wonderful uh, Bluetooth lock talk. And so I'm assuming some of these homes that have these lovely uh, camera systems also have the Bluetooth locks. And we can do a whole bunch of fun things with that as well. So the attack. So in the attack, we're going to talk about which cameras are weak. So in order to do that, we had to, just like Zach, go and buy a whole bunch of cameras. But, you know, since we, this is DEF CON and, you know, we're progressive these years, I wanted to make sure that we had diversity. So we have lots of different cameras that we tested. Lots and lots of them from different manufacturers of different sizes. So we went from the big guys to the small guys. That's them. So... Which one of them are not saying they're a security camera was my question. I showed you guys earlier all the articles and whatnot. So how many actually uh, say they do security? All but two. So there are two really, really, I'll say forthcoming companies that don't claim to be security cameras. They're just like, hey, we're this. This is what we are. Good for them. So what was tested? So we did a little bit of everything. So obviously we want to know what the offline time was. We want to know if it does any kind of notifications. So if you get bumped offline, network interference, whatnot, what's the threshold of notifications? Is there any type of cached video on the device? So if it's knocked off, how, you know, what, what amount's going to actually store locally before we have to recover? What, if there's any type of wired network options, if there's any type of SD options on the device itself for local storage, type of power, kind of was curious whether it was battery or wired, obviously it's points of failure there. 
Additional equipment needed for the function of cameras. So not all of them are just stick up. And any other performance observations. So because we were actually being pretty pragmatic about how this was done, we actually had a test procedure. So, you know, at zero stopwatch starts, at about a minute in, we did a targeted deauth attack. About every 30 seconds, we were waving our hands for motion recognition because some of the cameras did require it. And at about 10 minutes into the attack, we did the targeted deauth ending, so we terminated it, and we gave it about five minutes from there to see when it would come back online on the network. So this is my high-tech setup. It's pretty impressive. So we have the, uh, the timer, whatever camera was being tested at the time, the iPad with the camera app so we could vis actually visually see what was going on with the camera, when it was going to recover, and obviously a whole bunch of uh, airy play fun going on right there. So that being said, I like to always prove my work like in my good old math classes. And live demos never work, so. And live demos never work, so for you guys, I want you to know I spent many a weekends with my GoPro taping these lovely things, but I fast forwarded them for you. So this is your drink break, anyone who has coffee or anything, have a nice drink, take a second. Yeah, there's about like two minutes and I fast forwarded the crap out of these and split screened them, so uh, yeah, you get the idea. So now the results. Kuna. I love this little Kuna device. It was a Kickstarter, actually, um, as were a few of these. But the cute thing was the Kuna device, eh, it kind of did what it said it was going to do, not quite security. You know, it recovered after about a minute, 30, a minute, 40, after the deauth ended. The positives, it's a light. If the camera doesn't work, you got a front light. Yay. Another positive, it's wired. There's no way around it. There's no battery powered. It's, it's hardwired. Um, the negatives, only if the app's open are we getting notifications. Uh, one of the other negatives or positives, depends how you look at it, it had this really cool, uh, pardon me, the clanking is killing me. It had these cool status lights at the bottom of the light, which were super helpful, and I appreciate the developers that put them on there because you know, it's supposed to help out the consumers to let them know if it's paired and whatnot, or if it's online. That's always a good one for an outside security light to have it flash red. So one of the things we learned from the deauth attack is after uh, 10 minutes of it being online, uh, uh, deauthed, it kind of just doesn't recover. Uh, before that, if you cut it a little bit early, it'll do the, the minute 40 recovery. But you let it go longer, it kind of falls over. So in the testing, you know, these are consumer products. We did a few rounds of testing and found these things out. Well, like I told you about these cute little status lights, I was Googling, you know, for the point of this talk and trying to see if I could find you guys a pretty picture because I actually didn't fly to Vegas with a picture of the bottom of the, the status lights. And I come across this. On their website, they actually do tell you, good to them, that it will fall over and not recover and you have to reset up the wireless camera after 10 minutes of deauth. So let's just say hypothetically you have one of these lights out in front of your house, you lose power for more than 10 minutes, you forget, your, your light's useless, you know. So I would love to talk to someone who's doing the IoT monitoring of things. There's your, uh, your start for your little project because these are some of the things you should be looking for. So, because of timing, I'm going to try to go through these a little faster. The uh, media has this cute little Blink wireless HD monitoring and alarm system. The Blink is totally cute. I will give it credit that with movement, it will recover in about, about nine seconds. It does have an onboard about ten, five to ten second video recording. Um, it's clip-based, though. None of this is persistent recording. It's just clips. But the cute thing is it's easy to mount. It does continue doing the clips. Negative. You know, it does require a base station. It is battery powered. There is no option for uh, SD. There's no wired option. It is what it is. Amcrest, which I had never heard of this until, look, again, let's look at Amazon and find out what the best selling wireless camera on Amazon is. It's this one. I don't know how. Anyway, uh, it is cheap. It is cheap. But you would think that maybe Nest would. Anyway. Uh, so it recovers in two minutes, not a bad little camera. It keeps about 10 seconds on board storage that does have a wired option for, wire for wired network, not wired power. Um, it does have wired power. 
And there is an on-off switch on the unit. Not overall a bad camera. Somebody like that? <laughs> Yay, Amcrust! Anyway, D-Link. D-Link, we love D-Link just for the purpose that they don't actually claim to be a security camera. They're like, hey, we're a net cam. We're cool like that. I'm like, all right. So on the positive, it does have an SD option. Negative, there's, uh, there's no actual wired option for the camera itself. It recovers after about a minute after the de-auth. No movements required for that one, actually. So Netgear, cute little Arlo's. I love these Arlo's. They recover after about 45 seconds. They're versatile because they have a cute little magnet. That's how they attach. And they have a sticker. So remember to the war driving? Please, yeah, put, no. No, let's not put the sticker up and say, it's not even bad that it's a sticker. It actually just tells you what it is. So you have a few options when it comes to my little putting on my sunglasses and being sway and breaking into my little Ferrari warehouse. For these, these are great. I could just de-auth it, go, grab them all, put them in my bag, throw it in the Ferrari, and drive out. So, so again, requires a base station. It is battery powered. There's no SD or onboard storage. Again, no actual wired option for the camera itself because, again, pops on a little magnet, battery powered. Here, we're getting into the fun ones. So the Logitech, the Logi Circle. Oh, sorry. No, no, we All right, we got to run. I never thought that. Okay, anyway. Yeah. All right, ADD <laughs> Theater here. Logi Circle. Logi Circle recovers in about a minute 30. Um, it does do some uh, constant push notifications. Negatives has on-off switch on the unit. Again, magnet. Can grab it, throw it in my bag in the Ferrari, out of here. No SD or onboard storage. No wired option. Belkin, my little buddy, I'm going to give you like one more second. He recovers after, I call it the negative 10 seconds because it does have an onboard buffer. So the nice thing is it does come back pretty quick. So the onboard memory does recover it. I don't know if that was intentional or network in interference based because they don't actually tell you on their website and marketing that they do that at all. They also don't tell you that they're a security camera either. Yay, Belkin. Um, there is an on-off switch on the unit and we did find inconsistent push notifications through the app. So it doesn't help you too much. Samsung recovers after 10 seconds if there's immediate movement. Downside to that one, not immediate movement eh, until the cat walks through. So positive SD option, there is a wired option to it. Uh, the kind of negative is they're kind of working on their cloud option. There isn't one. Uh, there wasn't one for our camera. There was for other cameras. And so that's, that's forthcoming. And the SD storage only is on downloadable through the app, download the clip to the SD directly. It's not permanently, it's not running a constant cache. So the Canary all-in-one security device. Canary's awesome on the recovery if there's immediate movement. Again, please have your cat running through after a burglary. So uh, again, the Dioth attack, there's a very quick recovery, two seconds. There is a wired option. There's notifications. The sad part to the notifications is it takes 30 minutes. So it has to be offline for 30 minutes, and that's kind of not enough. Because uh, the other side of that, it has to be offline consistently for 30 minutes. We did try an attack where we de it for about 10 minutes, brought it back, de it 10 minutes, brought it back. You can pretty much do that for a while. So the negatives, uh, movement is re required for recovery. Nest. Nest. Not drop cam. Nest. Anyway, recovers after 20 seconds. Uh, Nest is actually pretty good. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna beat them up too bad. I, I hope that we see better things coming from them in the future. It does keep between 30, 30 seconds and four minutes of cache. We were finding inconsistencies through the testing of that just because we did everything at uh, 720p, but it seemed that lighting, any other um, ambient movements were causing that to change and fluctuate. There are push notifications for activity uh, they're pretty consistent, so that's definitely a positive. No SD option, no wired option. So, oh, I know, I'm going, I'm going, going. Okay, so very fast. Yeah, we have 10 minutes left. Oh, shoot. Uh, bad guys won't put in the effort. Yeah, right, bad guys are putting in the effort to do some of these attacks. We're not talking about it to consumers, so then what should consumers actually do? Uh, wired's better than wireless. Uh, verify and understand the limitations of the products. Like Zach said, we're trying to put together a database so that way everybody in this room can also contribute to what they're finding on their own. Nobody's talking about this to consumers. This is our consumer disclosure. Just tell consumers, this is what you're putting in your house to protect yourself. Let's be, let's be smart and understand what we're doing. These cameras do have unintended great uses like real estate. You, anybody selling your house in here? I feel, put one of these cameras that has the voice. Listen to what the potential buyers are telling you. Anyway, I'm out. I went too long. Thank you.
I have 10 minutes to do a whole topic. Uh, one thing I want to reiterate about Erin's side that I don't think she uh, really announced and made everyone really clear on that I thought was great. Um, so all these cameras, basically, you do the Wi-Fi deauth on, and they're offline. And Erin, is there any cache recordings for the majority of these cameras, or which ones have cache recordings? <laughs> Very few. I don't have a mic. Oh, her mic's not working. She said very few. Sorry. Um, very few. But yeah, so like I, I know that the Nest camera was 30 seconds or 30 seconds to four no, minutes. Absolutely. Four minutes is the four most. minutes is the max. So basically, once you de off these cameras, they're offline. They're not seeing any movement. They're not seeing anything. So if you Wi Fi de off them, guess what? You have no recording and there's no cache recording on most of the devices. The ones with SD card options do. So I have to talk about Windows versus consumers. I have 10 minutes. Go, go, go. We're going to get through this fast and the teleprompter is going to try to keep up with me. Good luck. Have fun. Um, so a lot of people are buying Windows devices especially with Windows 10. These are tablets. We have fun with them. Um, and we're not going to be talking about OEM devices with all these custom configurations because the Duo Security Crew, they did a great job on that. Uh, but we tell users all these things. Patchy device, install antivirus, use HTTPS, use a password manager, watch out for suspicious downloads, uh, don't use suspicious Wi-Fi, pick a strong password. All of these are great things. Oh, it's going to get faster. Uh, <laughs> reading. <laughs> Sorry, got to keep going. These are all great things we need to keep telling users, but these are things that are not going to stop this. So back at Defcon 20, I gave this talk about NTLM relaying. I don't have time to slow down. I have probably 20 slides to go. Um, back at Defcon 20, I gave this talk about NTLM relaying. You can watch it on YouTube or all the other places that it's up there. The old focus was about relaying NTLM network authentication to corporate accounts. We were focusing on corporate, 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 and focusing on internal attacks. For those of you who are just joining us today, Windows uses NTLM for some network authentication. It does use Kerberos as well, but it uses NTLM for hashing. It's an MD4 of the password, uh, but it's also used for network authentication and signing of network authentication at some points. NTLM network authentication has two flavors, version one, version two. Uh, basically has a client say, hey, what's up? Do you support this? Yep, here's my challenge, and here's the, uh, the hash of the hash. Have fun. Um, Microsoft recommends uh, to switch over to Kerberos. Indescribable. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. I, I hope that shows up in the video somehow. Um, and by the way, Windows auto-authenticates the thing. So how does Windows auto-authenticate? It uses, uh, we've talked about WPAD, there's not w, another WPAD talk, there's been two other WPAD talks about all the other fun things that with that, but with WPAD, Windows auto-authenticates with NTLM and some things, Windows 10 does this less, but Chrome still does it. Um, there's other ways to get users to auto-authenticate with things. Um, it's not just WPAD, you can also use injection of UNC pass into HTTP traffic if you're on a rogue access point. Uh, certain file formats support UNC pass and third-party applications that don't use uh, proper cores. Uh, yeah, I won't name names. Um, but for a while we talked about this on the corporate side, the corporate side, the corporate side on the internal attacks. But was it internal only? DEFCON 20 I talked about how Exchange Web Services was also vulnerable. But this is still a huge issue. Now I've talked about corporate, corporate, corporate. We never really talked about cracking these hashes, which are possible, and we've always said it's possible to crack them. We never talked about the implications of them. Um, so for corporate sites, we can do VPN access, SharePoint, shared passwords, all that fun stuff. But what about personal users? We're talking about fighting for the users, things that we're going to go and defend against them. Um, so well, what if they have a shared password with certain accounts, what if they're broadcasting these things? What about local file shares? What about those things? So we've talked about this for years for Windows XP, Windows 7. Then Windows 8 came along, and Microsoft decided to introduce a thing called Microsoft Accounts. On Microsoft Accounts, they included logging into your Windows device. Yay! I have a one minute demo video because demos rock. <sighs> this is the point where I actually have to wait the full minute. Zack attack. So we launch a rogue HTTP and SMB server in a tool called Zack attack. Yay! There's an update soon. Um, we use the MBNS broadcast. We set the options to broadcast to this device that has a rogue HTTP and SMB service. Exploit. We wait. This is real time, by the way. If you notice, there's a Microsoft account with an email at Outlook.com address. Yes, it's a fake email that we set up for this. And <laughs> there goes the auth. We run an OCL hash cat, crack the password. We get the password of Hunter Two Bang. Wow, no one got that. You guys are all noobs. I love you. I love you. We go ahead and go into Microsoft.com. This is the Microsoft account. This is the account used to log into the machine. We log in with that Microsoft account, the password we just cracked from a network broadcast authentication request. We copy, we paste. Copy and paste, come on, real time, you have sign a video in. Demo fail. Come on, get there. I have ten or five minutes left. We're logged in. Yay! So what does that mean? <laughs> I don't have time for applause. First off, Mubik said that I have to release an update. Uh, yes, Zach Attack's getting an update for Zach's who can't code good and want to learn to do other stuff good too. Um, yes, I have to post that, but yeah, there is cool new things with webhooks and with um, 
uh, the Microsoft accounts that we added in there. But yes, sure enough, your Microsoft account that you're using to log into those machines, to log into your Windows 10 devices, it's using your Outlook, Gmail, Hotmail, all those fun emails you use, it's actually broadcasting those across the network. So what? At a minimum, it's information disclosure of the user's information. But we, this is the first time offline password attacks are valid over a network thing. Yes, it's worked on some bad services before, but never in this thing. So what happens when you crack someone's password? You get in their Microsoft account. What do you actually get? You get their date of birth. You get their zip code. You get their billing information. You get the last four of their credit card numbers for all the billing things attached to their Microsoft account. And yes, these things are sensitive. This is a 2012 article from this, a reporter who got completely pwned. Um, but basically, someone got a hold of one of his accounts, got the last four of his credit card, and used that to pivot to all his things. You also get their search history, including things, well, th <laughs> this is a libertarian noob who wants to commit first degree murder. Um, and if you're a heavy Microsoft user, using your Microsoft account, not just all your thing, but for all the things, you've got your OneDrive, all your freaking files, your emails, you've got remote file access to systems if you haven't enabled, you've got Wi-Fi Sense, that fun thing to share passwords, if it's enabled, obviously. But yes, from a network broadcast thing, from sniffing someone on the same Wi-Fi access point, no, offline cracking is not original, but it's the original application of this. We've used it for offline passwords before, and, but we've never had it where it's harvestable from a LAN before. So what we've told users, patch your devices. Yes, it's still important, but it doesn't matter for this. Install antivirus. Yes, some ha uh, host intrusion detection systems detect the def default challenge. Just change it. You're cracking it anyways. You're not using a rainbow table. Um, by default, it uses NTL and V2, so it doesn't matter. Use HTTPS only. Well, you're going to hit HTTP endpoint and WPAD broadcast. Don't care. Um, use a password manager. It helps, but it doesn't actually help if you're cracking this. It helps with other accounts. Don't use or suspicious downloads. Doesn't apply to this. Whoops. Um, don't use the business Wi-Fi. Seriously, we tell people this. Why don't we just protect them? Pick a strong password. That doesn't mean something. Well, we should, we should never tell users just use a random VPN service because that's a horrible freaking idea to trust traffic with someone else. But for some reason, we think that's a good idea to tell people. Um, what we need to tell them, pick a strong password, enable two-factor authentication. Yes, in Microsoft, it takes over 10 steps to take and enable two-factor authentication, including in adding device passwords to all your devices. Oh, my God, it's painful. Um, mm -hmm. You need to use unique creds per site. Yes, that's important. So if someone gets one cred, they're not going to be public. And maybe avoid Hotmail and Outmail and all of one drive for a little bit until you can take and use a local account. How do we fix this? Disable NTL Moth. Uh, yeah, that kind of sucks telling users how to disable NTL Moth, but that's one way to fix it. The other thing is just don't use a Microsoft to log in the account to log into your system. Use a local account instead. So TLDR, got a stock Windows laptop, attack around the same network, use a Microsoft account to log in, you're pwned. All right, I have three minutes. Summary of the issues. Uh, fitness tracking devices that we talked about with Bluetooth can be tracked and be monitored for certain implementations. Wi-Fi security cameras, you de-auth them, they're off the network, there's no recordings, and some don't give notifications. A few give notifications after 30 minutes, and there's very limited caching on most devices, except for the two we pointed out. Consumer Windows laptops are constantly leaking creds for offline cracking. This is the first time we've seen that there's going to actually be offline cracking against those kind of things. Want to acknowledge these people for doing some cool things. Mubix, fuck you. And end of line. Two minutes remaining. We're going to go ahead and post the slides. <laughs> I'll slow down. We'll post the slides up there. Um, we're going to go ahead and I don't know where we can take Q&A because we're right up on the time. Uh, we'll, we'll, where can we do Q&A? Right to the side, outside? We have two minutes, so we'll have to go outside. Yeah. Uh, we'll take outside uh, to the next track and get in here. Thanks, everyone, for coming. We appreciate you guys coming out to you. Make DEF CON great again. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>